Welcome to Behind the Case Podcast, a podcast that focuses on navigating the challenges our clients face with divorce and family law in Dallas, Fort Worth, Texas. Behind the Case is brought to you by the Turner Monaghan Legal Team. With over 70 years of collective experience in divorce and family law, Together, Tyler Monahan, Keaton Monahan, Tina Campbell, and the Turner Monahan team will discuss real life cases, answer questions, and explore family law areas from divorce to child custody. Our goal is to clarify scenarios and demystify legal jargon, making the process less daunting and reminding you that you're not alone. So sit back and let's discuss what happens behind the case. Custody is a huge thing, you know, whether it's they're starting the divorce or they want to change orders on that. So what does that consultation look like whenever they're coming in to you saying, hey, I want to have this kind of custody with my child, whether it's full custody, 50-50 custody, no custody. What does that look like? Well, a lot of people say I want full custody with my child or my children. That term does not does that exist in the family code? So I asked them, what does that mean to you? Because full custody can mean anything, a lot of things to different people. Does that mean you want to be the quote unquote primary parent, which is also a word that does not exist in the family code as far as the parental conservatorship. And so we have primary conservatorship, joint managing conservatorship, and all parents in Texas are presumed to be joint managing conservators of their children, unless they meet the criteria for one of the parents to be sole managing conservator. And that is very few people that's going to involve family violence or other crimes. And so for the parents who come to us, I tell them they're going to be named joint managing conservators with the other parent. Now, what do you want to do regarding your children? Do you want to make most of the decisions regarding your child? Where is the child going to live most of the time? Like, and that's where it comes into play. What is the possession and access schedule look like for you as parents? And what is it that you want? And what do you want for the other parent? Because it is, it's, it, it can mean a lot of different things for a lot of different people. Texas is behind the custody laws from other states in that we don't have a 50-50 possession and access schedule. A lot of states do something different as far as possession time and that's where the child support calculations come from which texas is completely on our own on an island out with the custody laws and so we have specific percentages for child support for the parent who is called the non-custodial parent but it is the parent who has the possession schedule who the child doesn't live with most of the time. But, you know, we hear a lot that, you know, the dad most of the time doesn't want to be the weekend dad, doesn't want to be the dad that only sees the kids on the weekends. That's fine. You don't have to be. What schedule do you want? Because we can reach a lot of agreements outside of court that can give you a lot more time than just being weekend dad. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And, And I do think that there's been a lot more requests or conversations about 50-50. I seem to get many more people walking in going, I want 50-50. Okay. And it's the same kind of thing about full custody. What does that mean? Do you want to make part of the decisions, half the decisions? Are you all trying to split all the kid expenses exactly down the middle 50-50? Are we talking just about time 50-50? And is 50-50, if we're talking about time, practical? There are some parents that don't think about, can I really do that? You know, if I'm working night shift, how am I going to be the only person picking up and dropping off and taking care of for whatever period of time is my seven days or however you want to arrange it? Because there's all kinds of schedules. But a lot lot of potential clients walk in the door thinking that 50-50 is the presumption, that we start with the 50-50 split. And we don't. The Texas Family Code doesn't even address the concept. We have some judges in Tarrant County that are more leaning in that direction but not many. And those are mostly associate judges, not district court judges. And the district court judges at the end of the day are the persons who handle final trials and make the end all be all final decision. 
Now, if 50 50 is something that works for these people, great. We can reach agreements on just about anything and craft it so that it can work. But if the theory is you're going to go in and have a knockdown, drag out final trial, you're most likely not going to get awarded a 50 50 unless that's something that's just, you're just in front of a judge who's decided to have an unusual ruling on that particular day. Or you've been doing it on your own for quite some time. Yeah. That works for your family and for your kids. So let's say they hadn't been doing it for a long time. You know, maybe they went through a divorce where, you know, they were just emotional. They signed whatever paperwork. And now they're realizing, wait a second, I don't actually have what I'd want now. What are the steps I need to take to show like, hey, I should have more than this. And let's reopen that conversation. What are those steps they need to, to start talking about? I think it depends on what they what they have already and what they want. The standard in Texas under 50 miles is, we call it expanded standard, but it is it's a lot of time. It's a lot of time for the non-custodial parent. So it depends on what they want. Are you wanting equal time? Are you wanting to be the primary conservator? Do you want to be the one where the parent where the child lives most of the time? So I think it depends on what they want, because if there hasn't been a lot of change regarding the kids, if everything's going well, there's no issues with the other parent, it's really going to be hard to change that current order. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, if you do just want more time, that's where perhaps you come to us and we look at negotiating a settlement for more time. And, you know, we can we can negotiate even before we file a lawsuit. So, you know, it's very possible that we can change the orders if the other side's agreeable. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oftentimes modifications to orders, they have to have a basis. There, there, there has to be a substantial change of circumstances of either the parties or the kids or something. So we kind of need some kind of fact pattern to hang our hat on to, to go into a judge and say he wants more time because of this event, not just because he wants more time. Because the courts are very apprehensive about uprooting or changing or adjusting a kid's life schedule, whatever, on the whim of a parent. Now, if they say they've got divorced and they've had these orders in place for two or three years and they've just naturally migrated to more time by agreement. And so it's just kind of evolved into now they are doing this extra schedule and they want to just take what they're doing and putting it on paper and the other parties in agreement. No worries. We can do that. That's super easy. It's, it becomes an issue if it's, I just want more time and the other parent says no. We, we got to have some good reason to move into to a litigation kind of circumstance. But Heather's right. We can use the mediation and settlement negotiations before lawsuits are filed in between the filing and maybe avoid temporary orders. We can avoid court altogether if people are willing to at least have that conversation to try to reach an agreement. So what does a real change in circumstance look like because I think, you know, anyone that maybe is like, hey, I want to make yeah. this change, but do they actually have something that you know, makes that change valid? So the bar is lower than it used to be several years ago due to just case law updates. But I mean, still needs to be something. The child is not making it to school on time routinely, like it, not just three tardies in a, in a school year, but like routinely not doing well at school, not getting to school on time, homework not being done. We don't want to say there has to be harm to the child, but at least potential that this child is, this is not a good environment for this to continue. This needs to change, whether it's possession and access or, or custody. So, I mean, there needs to be more than, than just, you know, I, I, I want to see my kid more. It needs the substantial change in circumstance and is oftentimes regarding school. And, and this is, it could be an illness that's not being treated. We talked about mental health earlier. And if I've seen it a lot of it, you've seen it a lot with ADD. Mm -hmm. Kids are diagnosed with ADD or ADHD and one parent wants to put the child on medication, the other does not. But the child's not doing well at school and has behavior issues at school. So there needs to be something that needs to be done. And if if both parents have the independent right to make the psychological and psychiatric decisions for the child, we have to go back to court. That is a substantial change in circumstances with this child's 
mental health and his now his school. It's all intertwined. And so that's a that's another reason to go back to court. Or a party gets married to someone who they're divorced, they remarry, and whoever they remarry is causing problems in the household or disruptions. We see that a lot too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So it's hard to say these are the five things that are a substantial change of circumstances. I wish it was that easy, but it, it, there does have to be something tangible to show that the child is struggling one way or another. It may be that the kid's been in counseling and the counselor has expressed some concerns to the parents. Sure. Or the school has expressed some concerns, you know, acting out in school, getting in trouble more often. Really, school seems to be the easiest way for us to kind of go, oh, this is what it was before. This is what it is now, because you have a very good before and after to kind of look at. And it's not so subjective. Yeah. So that certainly helps. And again, we're not saying that there has to be, you know, true like physical harm, but we do have to show that there has been some sort of deviation in what's been going on in kiddo's life. As I know, like we're talking a lot about custodial parent, non-custodial parent. I know, Heather, you kind of explained like being the custodial parent means that they just live with you primarily. Mm. It doesn't mean that you're not a parent. Right. And I feel like a lot of people hear non and they're like, what? And that makes them want to switch. But at the same time, like, so let's say they had this agreement in place, you know, maybe they're not trying to switch it directly. But what if the non-custodial parent is being denied access? Mm. How does that look like? And is a custodial parent allowed to make that decision? Hey, I don't think it's safe for you to go over there and deny the access. Let's take a quick pause here. If you or someone you know is navigating divorce or family law matters in the Dallas-Fort Worth area, reach out to Turner Monahan for a free legal consultation. Call us at 817-332-4477 or visit us at tumolaw.com. That's T-U-M-O-L-A-W.com for a free legal consultation. Now let's get back to Behind the Case. Well, if there is a court order in place, then technically no. Now, if there's a quarter in place that says, you know, mom or dad gets first, third, and fifth weekends this time to this time, and that parent goes to the place and time to pick up the kiddo and the other parent refuses, then that opens the door for enforcement actions because our courts take their orders very seriously and they want parents to take the orders seriously. So denying a parent possession and access time that they're guaranteed by the court order is just as much of a violation than somebody not paying child support that is ordered by the court. So ultimately, the court could theoretically put somebody in jail for up to 180 days. And I have had a judge do that. Absolutely. And this was when a, a parent genuinely thought they were protecting their child. This particular judge is sees no gray. And this mother who thought she was protecting her child was not sending her child because, I mean, this child would hop the fence and run away to a neighbor's house when he knew his dad was coming to pick him up. I mean, that's how abusive the child felt and abused from dad. And that's, that was an abusive situation. And mom really thought she was doing the right thing. Well, we come to court and judge holds her in contempt and puts her in jail. And that's when I get appointed to represent her. And it was a very, it's a hard situation. And so what I would tell people is, we, we are never going to say that your child isn't telling you the truth and that your child may not feel safe for the other parent. Okay, then you call us first. Call an attorney as soon as you can because you need to get in court to modify that schedule or suspend the other parent's access because we don't want you to get in trouble because you're trying to protect your child on your own. Because again, you're going to be in violation of a court order if you do it on your own. So withholding one visit while you get a lawyer and get in place, probably not the end of the world because what I usually tell clients when they call for an enforcement action to file one, they, I said, well, I need at least three, two to three instances of where there has been a violation because the courts do not want us to go in and use the court's time, money, and all of this for a hearing on every single time a parent denies access or, or something like that. So 
a few instances is what it's going to take before the other side is going to even file the enforcement action. So you have a little bit of time to get settled and get an attorney and get get things filed with the court and get the other party served so that you can have a modification start to to try to get and and we could file a temporary restraining order to prevent that parent from having access immediately Mm -hmm. so that that parent is no longer in violation of withholding the child yeah and the court's going to look at that if if you've chosen to deny the other parents in possession and access in your claim it's because you're protecting your kiddo then the court's going to want to have seen you take some additional action besides just violating a court order, do something to fix the circumstances like filing the modification in a lawsuit. But if you're the other parent and your periods of possession are being you know, regularly denied and there's not those kinds of threats, then yes, that's absolutely when an enforcement action needs to be brought before the court so that somebody can be made aware. Because the court can order makeup time. The court can order that that parent who's denied possession has to pay your attorney's fees. And the ultimate penalty is jail time, but they don't typically order that right off the bat. They want to see a systematic denial before that potentially happens. But they can certainly educate the other parent about what is acceptable, what's not acceptable, what's appropriate, what's not appropriate. And that's exactly right, because in the situation I just told you about, that mother had been withholding for quite a while. So that's where it becomes a problem. And and that's where this particular judge did put her in jail. Mm-hmm. Because she had not yet made the attempts to do the mods. Correct. So you just need to be proactive in all respects. So a question also came up on the flip side. What if you don't? Like you have visitation and you don't show up to pick up the kid. Is it the same exact scenario where enforcement could just come into play? The court's not going to make you see your kid. There's a lot of reasons why a parent doesn't want to see their child. And the worst situation to put a child in is to be with a parent who doesn't want to have them around. So the court's not going to make you see your kid, but the other parent could file a motion with the court requesting for above guideline child support because they have the child more than the order states that they should, or even 100% of the time in some cases. And so that could be a, a result of not exercising your possession and access. And, you know, I think a lot of parents think, you know, the mom has more chance of getting the primary custody where the dad doesn't. What does that look like in Texas? Is is a gender bias? I don't think so anymore. I don't either. I think there are definitely some older courts, judges, that see things a certain way because that they've been doing this for 60 years and this is how it was done when they started. But I think more so now, most homes, there are still some homes with only one working parent, but so many homes are two working parents. So everybody's gone from the house the same amount of time every day. And we parents are tag teaming with the kids on who does what and helping out so much that it's really, I mean, we have dads being the primary parent quite often. Yeah, I, I just don't feel like there's that presumption any longer. Now, of course, the Texas Family Code, there is no presumption that mom is the better parent than dad or anything like that. But I really feel like certainly within the last 10 years or so, any lingering mom automatically wins has kind of gone to the wayside. I mean, we've certainly gotten custody and have many male clients who are primary parents or sometimes even the sole managing conservators, just depending on the circumstances. I, I really think it's facts now more so than gender. Well, even with the possession and access for even infants or small children under three. Absolutely. It used to be that there would be what we would call a step-up schedule for usually the father to get to overnights and then the standard possession schedule with the infant or young child. And that is just not the case anymore. Mm -hmm. They are having nursing mothers turn their child over with bottles that they have pumped and prepared for the dad. It's like, you know what? I mean, we have female judges on the bench who are making these rulings. And so saying that, you know, these are important for both parents to have as much access with these children as possible. And there's been so much research come out with parents and bonding and children and how important it is even for the dad to bond with the child. So I think we've come a long way as far as what primary looks like and even what possession and access looks like. Mm -hmm. Does the fact that maybe the 
the couple wasn't ever married come into play at all for custody? No, not really at all. That is not something that the courts are really concerned about. Again, they look at the facts and the, what's available and what the individual parents can provide and help do for the kiddo. And your marital status is of no concern or consequence to them. So if a client is listening that's like, hey, I want to, you know, like there is a circumstance I believe that needs to change. What is that step they should be taking and preparing when they come to you for that first consultation? Taking a look at the details, being able to articulate what they think that change is, not just my kiddo seems unhappy. Okay, what gives you that indication? And that's where you figure out, you know, did absences go up? Are tardies up? Did the grades change? Are they now no longer interested in doing all the extracurricular activities that they were doing before? Kind of figuring out what the facts are so that they're not just making that analysis while they're sitting in front of a complete stranger and being prepared to discuss some specifics about that. Because as attorneys, we need specifics. We are all about the specific facts, not just the general concept. And so we will ask lots and lots of questions. And so if you have that information already available and you've thought about it and kind of put it together, maybe not in paper, but just mentally put it together so you can articulate it, then you're way ahead of the game. Or if you have documentation, like you've kept a calendar, like he hasn't come to pick up the kid in these weekends, these number of weekends that I had, I marked it because, you know, for whatever reason, some parents automatically start documenting when they get court orders in place and some don't. And that's okay. I'm not saying that everyone should, but I think once you realize that there is an issue coming about, maybe you should start documenting and keeping a calendar because that helps us tremendously. Memories fade. Yes. You think you're going to remember? You don't because life happens. And memories fade terribly. So even if it's just a note on your iPhone or I used to tell clients to go to the dollar store and buy one of those cheap little paper calendars and just keep that. I think people would laugh at me now because nobody uses a paper calendar. But just some kind of notation so that you have that information because you're not going to remember in six months. You're not going to remember in three months. And it's way more persuasive for either one of us to be able to walk into court and go on June 12th, he failed to appear. On June 14th, he failed to appear. On June 15th, the child didn't go to school. On June 16th, the child didn't go to school. That sounds way better than just, he hasn't visited when he was supposed to and the kid's not getting to school, you know, some of the time. Yeah, it, it just doesn't have the same weight. Yeah, definitely. So what should a client do that's in the DFW area that's like, hey, I need to make that change? How do they reach out to you for that initial consultation? They can give us a call at 817-332-4477. And we have attorneys and paralegals, legal assistants that can take their call almost all the time. Very rarely is the phone not answered. And most of the time we are available to have a phone consultation with them immediately. Or they can schedule to come into the office and we can talk with them, you know, schedule a time to meet with them in person. They can also go to our website at tumolaw.com that's t-u-m-o-l-a-w.com and they can get some information for us there thank you for joining us on today's episode of behind the case if this episode offered insight or helped clarify some aspect of divorce and family law we encourage you to subscribe and share it with others who might benefit for those in the dfw area that are in need of a legal consultation you can reach us at tumolaw Dot com. That's T-U-M-O-L-A-W dot com or 817-332-4477 to schedule a free legal consultation. Remember, the journey through legal matters can be complex, but you don't have to navigate it alone. Until our next discussion, take care. Please note that the information provided in this podcast is for educational purposes only and is not intended as legal advice. Listening to this podcast or contacting our team does not constitute an attorney-client relationship. For advice on your specific situation, please consult with a licensed attorney in your area.